through the main passage today, Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 through 3. I want to share the message, Garments and Duties of the High Priest, based off of the sixth book, uh, which has just been uh, printed, and we've had our launching service. And so if uh, you get a chance, uh, I think in the next couple of months, it should be available online. And so please be on the lookout for it. So this word is based upon the sixth book of the History of Redemption series. So the Korean version, uh, just to give you a background uh, of God's timetable and God's uh, timing, was first launched in May of 2011. So it's been already several years, uh, already 10 years since its launching. Uh, The senior pastor from 2010 He commanded me three times, now I want you to work on the illustrations and charts. And so for uh, a year, I worked on the charts, the 77 uh, generations of the high priest and world transitions in Korean. And uh, at that time, I didn't even know how to use Illustrator. I didn't know how to use Photoshop. I didn't know anything. All of a sudden, the senior pastor just one one day comes by and says, you got to do it. And so, you know... I was uh, spending every night like crying, literally. I was like, oh, how am I going to do this? And trying to learn how to uh, work this out. But by the grace of God, uh, he gave uh, me the ability and the wisdom to be able to accomplish it. And so it was uh, in May of 2011, but you have to understand, this was the time when the senior pastor was um, sick. He was diagnosed with cancer, and he was having his operation during this time. And uh, after he came back from his, um, uh, from his surgery, he gave his first sermon in a long time. And the title was God's Exact Timetable. And this was, you have to mark the date, uh, June 16th, 2011. So the book was published even in the midst of his sickness. He had his operation. And you can see he, he lost a lot of weight. Uh, maybe you, you can't tell through the picture, but... Uh, he really lost a lot of weight, and his suit was really, like, loose, and he showed us his scars. It was like, you know, really, I thought my scars were, you know, really large, but his was just, like, they, they really opened them up. And so uh, he spoke in front of the, uh, the headquarters, his house there, um, and it had been a while, so everybody was gathered. It was a real hot day. The sun was, really, like, really, you know, Uh, shining upon us, and the message was God's exact timetable. And we understand that the history of redemption is uh, progressing forward and fulfilling to its completion according to God's exact timetable. And so uh, your lives, uh, my life, is all in God's hands. So is the senior pastor's life. As we look at his life and as we look at our lives, Our lives are moving according to God's exact timetable. And we need to trust that. And we need to entrust everything to him and and pray through those things. So if you look at his life, there are three periods of three years and six months in his life. And as you know, he prayed for three years and six months and seven days before he started the ministry of the word. And this was the foundation of his ministry. And then in the middle of his years, from February of 1994 until August 6th of 1997, it was a period of three and a half years where he did world missions. And this is where the brand churches were mostly set up. And I'm, this period is particularly meaningful for me because this was when I was introduced to the word. This was when the Canadian church was set up, the branch church. And so they did the um, dedication service for Moriah, on November, uh, November 7th in 1993, and then in the following year, in uh, February of 1994, he went out to do world missions. And then he comes back three and a half years later. Of course, you know, he did you know, go back and forth. On August 6th, which is 1997, that's when he came back officially. And that's why it's called Pyongyang Day, because we are celebrating his work of world missions. And then, as you just saw in the... Um, Previous picture, he did his service um, in front of the headquarters on June 16, 2011. And when you count three and a half years 
and you, you fulfill that, the next day becomes December 17, 2014. And that was the day that he departed into heaven. So you see, his life was according to God's exact timetable. Your life, my life, is all in God's hands. So please trust him and entrust all things to him, and I believe that he will lead your lives. So today, I want to share the message, uh, The Garments and Duties of the High Priest, based on the sixth book. So as an introduction, uh, let's go into, this is going to be kind of like a, not just a sermon, but we're going to try to study a few things here. So definition of high priest, there are two different uh, Hebrew expressions, and one is Kohen Gadol, and Gadol is like great or honorable, and so uh, Kohen Gadol means uh, honorable priest or great priest, and so Kohen is Gadol, and then Kohen Rosh, so Rosh is head, or it means first, and so it means uh, the head priest, or it means like the priestly leader. And so these are the definitions of a high priest. And so the high priest was the chief priest. Sometimes it's called the chief priest amongst all of the other priests. And he was the only one who was able to go into the most holy place uh, once a year, which was uh, in the seventh month and tenth day, the Day of Atonement. And the senior pastor, he organized the 77 generations of the high priest from uh, Aaron to uh, Phineas, and he said that each priest was like a lamp of God. And so uh, if the lamps were burning brightly, then the nation did well. But if the lamps were dim and they were not burning brightly, then the nation went into idolatry and they fell. So the high priest, the representative of the people, was very important in a spiritual state. They were lamps of God, supposed to be lamps, to be shining, to be awake, and to be alert. And so that's what the high priests were. And in the book, and also in the Bible, uh, it says that the ministry of the high priest revealed Jesus, who is the true high priest. And this is uh, definitely true if we look at a couple of verses here. Uh, Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So all of the high priests in the Old Testament, uh, they were humans and they were just temporary. But Jesus is our eternal great high priest. Uh, so there's the word great in front of there. And so all of that ministry was really a foreshadow of Jesus Christ in his first coming and also his second coming. So in the Bible, everything in the Old Testament, the, the sacrifices, the five different kinds of sacrifices and offerings, uh, the work of the priest and the high priest are all foreshadow of Jesus Christ's ministry in the first coming and in the second coming. And that's what we need to understand and read the Bible in that perspective. Hebrews 10, 20 through 22 also talks about this. And his body uh, was put on the cross as a sacrifice. And as he died on the cross, we see that the veil in the temple had, had torn from the top to the bottom. And uh, through his body, he made a, a way to the Father. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. You cannot say, you know, Father, without coming through Jesus. Jesus is the mediator. He is the high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. So you and I, we go through problems, but Jesus Christ, he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was human himself, and he went through all of those sufferings. He went through grief. He went through being homeless. He went through you know, financial difficulties. He went through sickness. He went through abandonment. He went through disappointment, betrayal. He went through even death for our behalf. So he sympathizes with our weaknesses. And he died on our behalf so that we can now come before God through him by faith. So Hebrews 4.16 says, you know, we come to God, the throne room of grace, with boldness and confidence to receive mercy in our time of need. Uh, with an interview with uh, Dr. Walkie, he said that people are interested in being 
happy more than being holy. So people are not interested in becoming like God, but they are just more interested in their own self-interest or their own success, or they're more, in their, they're more interested in their happiness more than becoming holy. And so Leviticus 11, 44, verse 45 says, Be holy because I am holy. And so to know God is to know His holiness. To be close to Him is to live a holy and consecrated life. And so our interests need to becoming more like Him, sanctified and uh, becoming more holy and uh, living a pious life. And so I pray that you and I, we can, as we draw close to God, we can get rid of the sin that easily entangles us and be able to keep repenting so that we can come closer to Him and see His beauty, see His face, see His glory uh, in our everyday worship. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen. So now part two, the high priest judged with the Urim and Tumim. So the high priest judged with the Urim and Tumim. And so the high priest had the task of mediating and judging. And so sometimes we go through life and we need to decide what do we need to do? What kind of decisions we, uh, you know, we need to make? Uh, we need you know, wisdom. We need direction. You know, should I do this business? Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I meet that person? Should I marry that person? There are things that we need to decide. Uh, we need to make decisions. There are times when we need to understand God's will. And so in the Old Testament, you know, they came to the priest and they gave the request and they mediated and prayed to God for answers. They used the Urim and Tumim. So let's look at that real quickly. Exodus 28, 30, uh, it says, uh, it's on the screen, so why don't we read it together? Ready, begin. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So they had this breast piece of judgment. Let me show you how it looks like. So you can see that on the breast piece of judgment, there were these 12 uh, stones representing each tribe. And what does this tell us? This shows us that the high priest needed to always uh, take the people into his heart and pray for them equally. And so we as humans, we like this person and we hate this person or we don't like that person. We discriminate. We have favoritism. But as a high priest, he was supposed to take on all of the tribes equally and pray for them, you know, taking out his own personal thoughts, his own emotion and his own feelings, and he needed to take them before God and pray for them equally, whether he wanted to or not. This was his task. And so there was no discrimination. That was his task. But as the high priest became fallen, they took the bribes and they, you know, they became fallen. They were not supposed to do that. God didn't like that. So let's look at a couple of verses here. We are called as the royal priesthood. So Romans chapter 15, verse 1 and 2 says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are without strength and not just please ourselves. Let, us, uh, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. So what does this say? Uh, we need to have a wide heart to be able to uh, take in into our hearts uh, everybody and take on even uh, taking on the weaknesses of others. You know, what, what is a weakness? It could be a physical ailment. It could be, you know, they could be mentally weak. They could be weak in their faith. Uh, they could be weak in many different areas. But we need to take them into our bosom, into our hearts, and be able to pray for them equally. And we need to edify and lift and build each other up. This is our task as the priests. And so many times, you know, we have a subjective view. We want to, you know, just like this person, and we want to just, you know, not, not use this person. But we are body of Christ. God needs everybody. We cannot say, oh, you know, let's just, you know, do this work without this person. We don't need them. I'll just do it by myself. He wants us to work uh, in harmony, and he wants us to work in cooperation. 
And so uh, even Jesus said, even the blind man has work to do. And so everybody has some kind of good point, something that God wants to use. And so we need to edify each other and build each other up and be able to cooperate with each other. Proverbs 11.1, 1, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. So this is talking about physical uh, balances. So many people, they use these um, altered balances, false balances, to cheat the people. But this is not just talking about uh, physical balances or skills. This is talking about our hearts. We cannot be able to turn to the right or to the left. We need to always be centered on the word. Our decisions, our um, main centeredness must be based on the word of God alone. Proverbs 20, 23 says, Differing weights are an abomination to the Lord, and a false scale is not good. So in decisions, we need to look at it from the view of God. What is God saying in this situation? So Urim is lights, and Tumim in Hebrew means perfection, so lights and perfection. So in the Old Testament, the high priests used the Urim and Tumim, uh, and traditionally, they had the shape of rocks, like a black and white rock, where they used to cast lots, and they uh, sought the will of God. But what is the Urim and Tumim of today? How can we make decisions? How can we discern God's will? First of all, it is the Word of God. The Word of God is always uh, the first priority in seeking God's will. So nothing that we, every decision that we make, must be based on the Word of God. Nothing that we do must be contrary to the Word of God. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So His Word is the lamp that leads us in His will. Psalms 34, 33 verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all His work is done in faithfulness. So God's Word is upright. And when we receive God's word, we too will be upright. We will not turn to the left or right, and we will be uh, living with integrity. So the word of God itself is upright. And when we hold on to God's word, it will always keep us centered and balanced and lead us into the right way. Next, it is prayer. And we cannot just have prayer, but we need to have also, we cannot just have the word, but we need prayer as well. And we need to pray through the high priest, Jesus Christ. And so we pray in the name of Jesus. We are not praying in our own name, but we pray through the name of Jesus. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. So what is this saying? First of all, trust in Him. Entrust it to Him. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 you know, do not worry, but entrust all things to Him. And then, do not lean on your own understanding, your own experience, my thoughts, my fleshly thoughts, my opinions. You have to take that all away and entrust it to God. And then what does it say? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. So, in every situation, God, I know you are in this. I know you are working. I entrust everything to you. I trust your providence and your sovereignty. And... In all your ways, acknowledge Him. So, God, you are here. You are working. I give you thanks and glory and praise to you. So, in every situation, you are acknowledging God's providence and sovereignty. I don't understand, but I believe that you're working here. And so, we give thanks in all circumstances. That is the way we acknowledge Him. And when we do that, He will make your path straight. So, um, Psalms 50 verse 23 says, When you give thanksgiving offering to Him, you will see the salvation of God. He shall lead you to the paths of righteousness. John 14, 13 says, When we pray in His name, He will do it according to our prayers. And so what is the blessings of being upright? So sometimes when we think that we, when we be honest, when we are honest and upright, and when we live with uh, integrity, Sometimes it seems like we're losing out or it is a minus for us. But in the end, those who live with uprightness are truly, truly, truly blessed. Psalms 84.11 says that 
uh, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So God blesses without holding back. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, in a situation, you know, if you lie a little bit and, you know, you change things here and there, you may seem like you're gaining something, but in the end, you will lose out. If you're honest and you have integrity, God will bless you in the end. Proverbs 15.8 says that the sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So he answers our prayers. Those who are upright, he listens to their prayers. And so being upright means centered. So what does James say? Do not have a double mind. So, you know, you double-minded people, you know, repent and seek God by faith. And when you do, when you have this uprightness, this stableness, you know, trusting the word of God, God will see through that he will fulfill his word. Proverbs 15.9 says, the path of the upright is a highway. So he opens up our uh, path of life. It's like a highway. So if things are, seems like they're like blocked on every direction, and you know, it's all dark and you don't know what to do, you know, pray to him. And when you live uprightly, the gates will be open, the doors will be open, the highway will be open, just like he parted the Red Sea. And then Proverbs 2, seven, he says, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. So he prepares this wisdom for us. And so when we make decisions, we need God's wisdom, his discernment and understanding. And so when we receive the wisdom, we can make correct choices and correct decisions. Should I marry that person? Should I not marry that person? Uh, just as uh, an example, uh, there, there was a time, you know, uh, I didn't get married until I was 40 years old. Uh, but uh, when I became 40, you know, that's when I got married. And I was trying to, you know, figure out, you know, who am I going to marry? But, and so uh, I'm praying, you know, I've been praying, you know, the senior pastor, he, he promised, you know, that he would, uh, he would marry me and, and he introduced me to somebody. And, you know, he kept on saying that for like 17 years. And he also made an announcements. He made an announcement on Wednesday service, you know, in 2014. And before he made an announcement, uh, a public announcement, during tea time at Shalom, he first actually asked the female workers, he called me out, you know, James, come out here. And so I came out, you know, oh, what's he going to say? And, and he said to all of the uh, female work staff workers, if there's anybody who wants to marry Pastor Park, put up your hand right now. And nobody put up their hand. All the, all, I saw all of the girls, they were like, you know, trying to, you know, uh, avoid his eye contact. And I, I was, you know, you know, I was a little embarrassed, a little uh, shocked. I thought maybe one person might, you know, put up their hand. But, and then the next day he made a public announcement uh, on the Wednesday service. And he said, whoever wants to marry him, bring in your applications. And, and he did introduce me. And I did end up marrying to, to, to the person that he introduced to me. And, but when I was trying to pray for who to marry, there were all of these questions and dilemmas, but uh, everything just fit into place. So when you're asking for direction, everything is confirmed by two or three witnesses. So everything will become a match. Not just one, but two and above. Two or three things will become like a match. And so when that becomes a, a match, then you can probably uh, say that that is the will of God. And so there was a person that uh, Pastor Yu was introducing, uh, wanted to introduce to me. There was a person that Pastor Lee wanted to introduce to me. And it happens, it, it happens to be the same person. So like, oh, this is strange. This is maybe, you know, something that uh, God wants me to uh, look into. And so it was the person that I eventually married. And um, uh, some, somebody even said, you know, Pastor, I have someone I want to introduce to you. You know, we'll, we'll even buy you a house and, you know, you know, just we'll introduce you to her. I said, no, I already got the answer. I already, you know, I made my decision. And the first day I met my wife, 
And, you know, she had no clue. She just, you know, um, she, um, she didn't know what was going on. The first day I said, I'm going to marry you. I got the answer. And she's like, what? <laughs> she's like, you know. And, and I said, I already got the answer. I, I don't want any, any other answer for you. I want you to say yes. Right now, today, we're going we're gonna to get the date. When do you want to get married? And, and I wouldn't let her go. And this was like the first time that we met. And so she was a little, you know, shaken, but uh, she said, uh, okay. And I think, you know, she wanted to leave. Uh, but eventually we, uh, we did get married. And, <laughs> uh, and I think uh, we're both happy in the Lord, in the Lord. You know, we go through many differences. Uh, and um, there's many things that we work through, but... Uh, the secret to our happiness, I think, was always uh, thanksgiving. Just always being thankful for each other. Always, you know, saying thank you, saying I love you, and appreciating each other, listening to each other. You know, when I have something that I want to say, she listens. When she has something to say, you know, I listen. And so this is, you know, the will of God. Uh, I got off on a bad track here. When we're talking about high priests, and we're talking about... <laughs> and so... The high priest sympathizes with our weaknesses as we sympathize with our partners. So next, uh, the final judgment takes place through the second coming. Uh, so through the second coming, uh, the final judgment, he will judge us according to our deeds. But not just our deeds, but he will judge our intentions and our motives. So we can deceive people. And people say, wow, that, you know, you believe well and you get praise, but you cannot deceive God. God knows even your intention. So you can be doing a right thing, but your motive and your intention and your purpose can be wrong. And God knows that. But for people, they say, wow, he made a lot of offering. Wow, he's serving a lot. And we don't know those things. Only God is the one who judges our every thoughts and intentions and our motives. Isn't that scary? We will be judged by that. So this life of faith is not for people, although we need to you know, live a life with integrity and edify, but we need to always live in front of God. So part three, the last part. Uh, the high priest gives the freedom from the city of refuge. And so what does this mean? Uh, there were cities of refuge that... Um, people could run to if they killed people unintentionally. And so Joshua 20, verse 2 and 3 talks about this, uh, that the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally without premeditation may flee there, and they shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. So what this is saying is that, let's say, for instance, in the old days, they were like uh, chopping wood with an axe, and the head of the axe, like, it flew off, and it hit somebody walking by, and they... They died. And so that was unintentional without premeditation. So that person can, on the spot, he needs to run away to go to this uh, city of refuge. And he was able to live there. He was able to be freed uh, from being uh, judged and killed. And so these are the cities of refuges. So how long does he need to stay there? How long? Uh, well, we'll get to that. Our hate is the sin of murder, 1 John 3.15. Take that into consideration. So the high priest must die. So uh, if the person uh, goes to the city of refuge, he needs to keep living there until the high priest dies. So if it's an old high priest, uh, you might uh, be able to live there for a couple years and then get freed. But if it's a young high priest, he might be there for a long time, you know, hoping and <laughs> wishing that he would die or something. So Numbers 35, 28 uh, because he should have remained in a city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer shall return to the land of his possession. This is important. So the person ran away from his hometown, and he needed to stay there. This was not his hometown. And when the high priest died, then he was able to return back to his hometown. Now this becomes very important, not, for the, not only for Israel, but for us. Uh, Joshua 26, you know, says the same thing. So let's look at the death of Aaron 
and its return and its relation to the return from Babylonian exile. Numbers 33, verse 38 and 39 uh, says that Aaron died at the age of 123 years old on the first day of the fifth month. So then Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the sons of Israel had come from the land of Egypt on the first day in the fifth month. So this is very important. First day, the fifth month. Aaron the high priest dies. And this is very important because it connects to the Babylonian exile. So the second exile, led by Ezra, and he led the spiritual reform, uh, they made their return on the first day of the fifth month. So Ezra 7, 9 says, For on the first of the first month he began to go out from Babylon, and on the first of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of his God was upon him. So what is this saying? They were in another country, Babylon, Babylon in captivity. But on the date that the high priest Aaron died, uh, they were able to make their return, uh, the second return, uh, and this was uh, led by Ezra, and they were able to make a spiritual reform. And so through the death, that date and the death of the high priest Aaron, and that uh, equates to the return to the people's hometown. And so the first day of each month is uh, like a, uh, it's a new moon, right? And so that's how they counted the months, is they started with a new moon. It means a new start, a new chapter. And so Jesus frees us from the city of refuge and allows us to return to our true hometown. So Jesus died and brought us freedom from sin and death so that we may return to our true hometown, which is heaven. And so uh, I'm going to skip over those verses, Romans 8, 1 through 2, Hebrews 10, 14. He's freed us from the law of sin and death. But the important thing is Philippians 3, 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are from different nations, for instance, like America, you know, France, or uh, we are from Israel, or Europe, uh, or, you know, Japan, uh, America. And we say that is our citizenship. But that is not the true reality. The true citizenship is uh, of heaven. We are sons and daughters of God, and our citizenship is in heaven. And so we need to have this passport, the citizenship, in order to go into heaven. And so uh, one time uh, when, I was, when I was sick, this was 2007, uh, and I'll probably end with this story. Um, that's when I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, terminal cancer, you're going to die, the doctor said. It was like the last stages. And it was like 10 centimeters of uh, cancer growing in my colon. And I was like 31 at that time. And at that time, I was like really like working out. I was like, like right now, I'm like really, you know, skinny compared to that. You know, I'm like, my shoulders are out to here. I was bench pressing like 360 pounds. My legs were like huge, like tree trunks. And I was like a bodybuilder. And all of a sudden, the senior pastor says to me, he starts yelling at me, you know, go get an MRI. And I was like surprised, you know, what's, what's he talking about, MRI? And I got an MRI, and sure enough, the doctors said, you have terminal cancer, and, you know, you better get ready. You have, you know, a few percent chances of living. And so this 10-centimeter uh, colon was living, uh, growing in my colon. And the senior pastor makes an, uh, he, he tells me, oh, you know, Pastor uh, James, and he's really being nice, you know, Saturday. I reported to him. He says, when you go to Canada, you know, come get your treatments and come back. I'm praying for you. I'm going to have all of the uh, congregation pray for you. Don't worry. You know, you'll be okay. And, you know, I got my assurance there. And, and I said, yeah, but senior pastor, can I, can't I just go to Yoju and drink the water and be healed? And, healed? and he said, no, you, you know, you need to just do what you can and go to Canada and get your treatments and, you know, go through the chemotherapy and the radiation and, and get your surgery. And when you come back, I'll marry you. you know, he, maybe he was just, you know, uh, uh, afraid that I wouldn't come back or something. He just kept on using that as a bait for me and, you know, trying to reel me back in. And then he says that really kindly, you know, like a, a father and son, you know. And then the next day on Sunday, I had already left. 
And on Sunday, he makes this announcement uh, during the second service again. He's, he's making a sermon. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of a sermon, out of, the, out of the blue, and you know Pastor Park? That young pastor, he has cancer. It's over for him. It's over. And I was like, what? What's he talking about? He just told me I'm going to be okay. And he said, you know, he, he cannot even be like, uh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, cardboard uh, uh, collectors at, at the Seoul station. You know, they carry the you know, cardboard and they collect the cardboard. He, it's, it's over for him. You know, he's got cancer. And then he starts talking about me. And then he says, you know, Pastor Park, you know, he was born in Korea and his parents sent him to, uh, you know, abroad for a language study. And, you know, actually I was born in Canada. And I'm like, what's he talking about? I wasn't born in Korea. And what's he, you know, I know that he doesn't lie. So I'm just trying to, you know, figure this out. What's he talking about? And then, you know, he went to, and he's, he really studied a lot. And, and now he's got cancer. And, that, and so we need to pray for him. And then, and he said a, a couple more things. But later, I, I understood what he was try, trying to say. There was two things that I understood. And he was speaking on a spiritual level. First of all, when he says that it was over, you know, I realized my old self needed to die. Ah, my old self needed to die. It's done. The old self is done. And I needed to become a new person. And not only that, but when he kept on talking about I was born in Korea and you know, I went to study abroad, I realized that our hometown is the word. The word is what has birthed us. So Father God is our father, and the word, you know, the word from Korea is our hometown. So I truly realized that Canada is not my hometown anymore, that Korea, or the, the place of the word, the word is my hometown. And from that point on, I made a decision, and he gave me a great lesson, never to ever think about going back again to uh, my physical hometown. My, even when my mother was dying in 2010 and 2011, I made a decision, I'm not even going to think about it and go back. Of course, I prayed for her. Uh, you know, I was you know, talking to her and I was you know, caring for her. But even in that sickness, and when she passed away, I said, I'm not going back. Unt unless the senior pastor says so, I'm not going back. And at the last moment, he says, go. And, you know, he said, go. And so I realized your hometown is not you know, Europe or Canada or America. Your true hometown is the word. Please believe that. Amen. And so we need to go as God directs. So if he says to stay, to stay. If he says to go, to go. You know, it's according to his will. So I pray that you may be able to understand that and be able to have a heavenly perspective, an eternal perspective on your life. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen. So conclusion. What, our, what are our spiritual clothes? And uh, just go through a couple. Clothes of righteousness, Psalms 132, verse 9. Let the priest be clothed with righteousness. So it's, it's the righteousness of Christ. So sometimes uh, we think that we are righteous, but there is no one righteous, right? We can only be righteous in Christ, in Christ. And so sometimes we judge people on the standard of my righteousness, but we need to... Judge ourselves with God's righteousness. Amen? And so uh, we cannot use the law as a, uh, like a murder tool to judge others and condemn others. Clothes of salvation and praise, Isaiah 61, verse 3. To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And so, is that the same verse? Yes, it is. So, uh, next, the last verse, the clothes of glory. We need to wear the clothes of glory. But this is at the last trumpet, where we will be resurrected and we will uh, be transfigured. And we will have a glorious body. He himself will be our clothing. Amen? He himself will clothe us with his glory and cover all of our shame and all of our, you know, sin. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 40 and 41 says, There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is one. There is one glory of the sun and one another glory of the moon 
and another glory of the stars. For stars different from star and glory. So we will have a different kind of brightness in heaven according to our lives of faith here on earth. So we will ultimately be clothed with God himself, the clothes of glory. And so uh, please have this hope that God will clothe you in his glory and cover all of our sin and shame and death. And I pray that you may be able to be faithful priest, faithful until the end and become a true Zadokite working in the Ezekiel's temple. And when you're faithful to him, and he will hold on to you and lead you onto the path of righteousness. And I pray and bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... Uh, this blessed and holy Lord's Day where we can receive your word based off of the sixth book of the History of Redemption series. Father, as the royal priesthood, help us to intercede for the people and to be able to give a living sacrifice to you. Father, if there are people who are sick or in need, suffering from mental or physical problems, may we be able to pray for them and be able to uh, intercede and be able to find answers to their problems. Father, we thank you for all of the people who have come here and who are watching online, uh, worshiping in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.